The belief of jinn is wrapped around the religion of Islam. And it's even said though that you can't be a Muslim without believing in jinn. Now jinn have done some great and amazing things according to the religion of Islam. However, there are some dark truths when it comes to jinn. Some of these beliefs are said to stem from Arabic folklore. The beliefs about jinn are not always agreed upon even in Muslim circles. Starting at number 10, did you know that there's a belief that there are several types of jinn, not just jinn as a blanket term. No, there are different types of jinn, like some that can fly, others that can shapeshift. Although it is believed by Muslims that those that can shapeshift in human form cannot appear as a prophet Muhammad. And over in the Hadith, it supports this belief. There's a passage that says there are three types of jinn. One type that fly about through the air all the time, another type that appear as snakes and dogs, and an earthbound type which resides in one place or wonders about. Also, there is a belief that jinns are assigned to humans. It's believed that every single human being has a jinn assigned to them, specifically a kind of jinn called a Kareen or jinn comrade, and this type of jinn will encourage people to actually do evil. Having lived with a human being since the time of birth, these jinn are said to know absolutely everything about a particular person, and that means that anyone that's able to communicate with the jinn, like a psychic for example, could actually gain access to secrets about people, and that person may be like, how did you know? That psychic may have been talking to a jinn. Now there's a passage in the Hadith that says, every one of you has been assigned a companion from the jinn. There are all sorts of beliefs about that. I'm not gonna get into that right now because we have so much more to go through. We're talking about the belief that jinn have free will. So in Islam, angels were created to obey Allah completely. They don't have free will to disobey him. Unlike the jinn, Muslims believe that Allah gave the jinn free will to obey or disobey him like human beings. So whoever of the jinn decides to believe in Allah or who desires to disbelieve in Allah and do evil things, they can do so. And the majority of jinn are said to be unbelievers. In fact, the number of unbelievers that are of the jinn outnumber the unbelievers among humans. Jinn are also similar to human beings. They are believed to resemble humans in the sense that they eat and drink just like us, as well as they have children and they grow old and die. And also they're gonna be subject to the judgment of God. So they will either be sent to heaven or hell according to their deeds and according to the mercy of Allah. Jinn can also get really annoyed and upset though if you secretly disturb them or hurt one of their loved ones, even if you're completely unaware that you did so. The next scary belief we're looking at is Jinn possession. And this is probably one of the scariest beliefs associated with jinn. Yeah, jinns are believed to be able to possess human beings. There are numerous reasons as to why a jinn would even possess somebody in the first place, from just being straight up bored and wanting something to do, to being some sort of punishment for someone's own carelessness in committing evil deeds. But oftentimes though, people who are possessed by jinn may not appear in the pain and the torment like we see in the feature films or even on TV shows. However, individuals simply that may just get straight up angry or completely moody or feel like they're forced to do certain things without being able to stop are also telltale signs that they could be possessed by jinn. So according to that belief, I'm not saying go out on a witch hunt and be like, oh my God, that person got super angry real quick. He's possessed. <laughs> nah. I'm just sharing the beliefs that exist out there. All right, so at number five, this belief is that jinns live in different places. And let me break it down. Jinn apparently, they thrive in places like deserts, as well as, you know, certain districts like the mountainous Chitral district in Pakistan. And also it's believed that they live in and around a sinkhole in the wastelands outside of Kardo, Somalia. Other places that jinn like to live in are caves and crossroads, as well as garbage dumps and also large bodies of water and it's believed that the jinn also live in the upper atmosphere of those that can fly. Graveyards are another place that jinn live and they can even be found in bathrooms. The belief at number four involves the hatif. Now the hatif is a type 
type of jinn and it's just really a disembodied voice and there's no physical form to this type of jinn. The Hatif is a jinn who they imitate human voices. So if it sounds like you're speaking to someone and you hear them answer back, it may not necessarily be that person responding to you. It could just be the jinn imitating their voice. Jinns are known to be pranksters and play tricks on people like this. So it isn't uncommon to find stories like this in Islamic circles. Let's talk about the creation of the jinn next. Jinn were created from smokeless fire. Yeah, that is very interesting. And it's a lot different than the earth that human beings are made from and even the light that angels are made from according to Islam. Now in the Quran, it does support this belief and it says that and the jinn we had created before from smokeless scorching fire penetrating through the skin. That's found specifically in Surah 15 verses 27. Number two brings us the belief in the devil. Now, Iblis in Islam is the personal name of the devil, and he's believed to also be a jinn. At the time of creating human beings, God had ordered all the angels to bow down before Adam, but Iblis refused. And he said that, no, he was better, he was created from fire, but humans were made from dirt and clay. So for disobeying this direct command from God, God threw Iblis out of heaven. At one point, he was allowed to dwell in the heavens, but his punishment was postponed until Judgment Day. Now over in Surah 18 verses 50 in the Quran, it says, And remember when we said to the angels, prostrate to Adam. So they prostrated except Iblis. He was one of the jinns. He disobeyed the command of his Lord. But what's also scary about this is that since Iblis looks to cause destruction and lead people to do evil things in the world, he can sometimes appear in human form to recruit people to work on his side. The final scary belief about jinn that I'm going to share in this episode involves the jan. Now the jan are a type of jinn that are shapeshifters as well, but these ones they live in the desert and they often take the forms of whirlwinds as well as it's said that they even take on the form of white camels. They have the power to hide or reveal bodies of water in the desert and this all just depends on whether they like you or not. Throughout history though, it is said that the Jan have protected certain armies that they deem to be holy and righteous and they actually like them, while others, they just completely stop them because they feel like, hey, you're not good people, so we're gonna interfere with what you're trying to do. So you see, it's surprising that their influence could literally have affected the course of history according to this belief. And according to Islamic theology, jinn are invisible entities who roamed the world before Adam was created, who was the first human. They were created by God out of a mixture of fire or smokeless fire. And in this episode, I'm sharing 10 types of jinn that exist in Islam. Starting at number 10, we have the Marid. The Marid are considered the most powerful tribe of jinn. And the word Marid means rebellious. They're the classic type of genies like you would see in movies like Aladdin, and they're often associated with water. Marid can change their shape, and they're said to have a lot of pride and want to show off a lot. Usually depicted with hands folded with a barrel chest. Number nine brings us Ifrit. Now they're only mentioned in the Quran just one time. In Islam, the term Ifrit is always followed by the expression of the jinn, the ifrit of the jinn. That's how usually sentences are written. They are very powerful and they emerge out of smoke from the ground and they form into large winged demon creatures and they actually bleed fire. And they are from the underworld which is where the evildoers are gonna go for their punishment. We have ghouls at number eight and these are jinn that haunt the cemeteries. They are flesh eating creatures and they like to eat living flesh as well as dead flesh. They don't care. Sometimes though, they appear as beautiful women to lure men. Moving on to number seven, we have the Silat. So these also take on the form of beautiful women to lure men and they also have intercourse with them and can procreate with them. These are akin to the succubus, but the Silat aren't always around doing evil things. Sometimes they do a bit of good as well. Number six brings us the Sheik. So the Sheik is a lower form of jinn and also a half creature, like really like half formed creature. They look very weird. And it's said that they go after travelers who just 
aren't paying attention. And the scary thing is that the sheik are able to procreate also with human beings and they can produce offspring and these offspring are called nasnas -nas, and they also look a lot like the sheik. Next up we have the hatif. So hatif is a type of jinn. They have no physical form, they're just disembodied voices and the hatif mimic the voices of people's loved ones and call out their names. And again they have no form but they always sound like somebody that you know whether it's a close friend friend or family member, somebody that you're related to. So if you do hear your name being called out and it sounds like somebody that you know but you don't see anybody, it could be a Hatif. So I'm looking at the Korean next up and the Korean they incite humans with evil suggestions but they can become good also based on the good deeds of humans. So for example it's said that the Korean of the Prophet Muhammad became Muslim. However it is uncertain and it's not really specified whether or not any other Korean outside of the Prophet Muhammad have become good for the actions of another human being. Next up is Hin. So scholars debate this whether or not the Hin are a subclass of Jin or a completely separate group altogether who rival the Jin. But the Jin and the Hin, they're said to have waged war against one another. And according to some accounts, the Hin supported the angels led by Iblis during a battle against the Jin that lived on the earth. Hin are also created out of fire, just like the Jin. I'm looking at the Jan now at number two, and the Jan are shapeshifters who live in the desert and they take the forms of whirlwinds as well as white camels. Now, they're pretty open minded when it comes to humans. They have the power to hide or reveal bodies of water in the desert, and this is all just dependent on whether or not they like a particular traveler. The Jan are also the enemy of the ghoul, and throughout history, the Jan have protected quite a bit of armies that they have deemed righteous while stopping those who are seen to be unworthy. So history is greatly affected of whether or not the Jan step in like this. And at number one, we have the Palis. So the Palis is just straight up creepy. Like they are vampiric foot lickers that are found in the desert. And according to the legends, they are not that smart though. They attack people when they're sleeping and they drain their blood by licking the bottom of their feet. And since they're not very smart, you can easily fool them just by covering the bottoms of your feet and they're gonna be like, I have no idea what to do. <laughs> the Jinn have free will and some are believers and others are even disbelievers. A good example of this would be the being Satan. In Islam, Satan is a jinn who became a disbeliever. Now there's a passage that says, and some of us jinn are Muslims, and some of us are disbelievers who have deviated from the right path. And whosoever has embraced Islam, then such have sought the right path. And that's found in the Quran, Surah 72 verses 14. Now the next thing I want to share is that the jinn are beings that Allah had created before mankind and he created them out of fire. You can find this in the Quran Surah 15 verses 27 and it says, and the jinn we created aforetime from the smokeless flame of fire. It's kind of crazy thinking about it because like we as human beings like we decay and become the earth once again but imagine making a being out of fire. Like what sort of texture would their skin be? Are they just constantly hot all the time? But anyways moving on. Jinn can also see us but but like we can't see them. And you know, the crazy thing is some animal can actually see jinn. Another passage from the Quran, it says, Verily he, Satan, and his tribes of jinn see you from where you cannot see them. And that's in the Quran, Surah 7, verses 27. The Hadith also talks about this. It says like, if you hear the barking of dogs or the braying of donkeys during the night, seek refuge in Allah from Satan, for they see what you do not see. So yeah, it looks like animals can see some of these beings at times and they're just barking and you're like, what are you barking at? They see something that you don't see. Another Islamic belief about jinn is that every human being is thought to be assigned a special type of jinn from birth and this kind of jinn is called a Kareen or a jinn comrade. And this jinn, it's not your best friend. This kind of jinn will encourage you to do evil stuff. Even the Prophet Muhammad is said to have had a jinn comrade but according to Islamic tradition, apparently his jinn converted to Islam so it became a believer. And having lived, of course, with the human being since birth, these jinn know absolutely everything 
anything about them. And this means that anybody that has the ability to communicate with Jin, like let's say a psychic for example, I don't know, could actually ask the Jin stuff about you and just relay it to you. So yeah, they may not necessarily be seeing your future or just know stuff about you. They may be talking to the Jin and you can't even see it happening. One thing I found very interesting is that the Prophet Muhammad's guidance applies to the world of mankind of course and also the Prophet Muhammad was sent to the Jin. In the Quran it says, say O Muhammad, it has been revealed to me that a group of Jin listened to this Quran. They said, verily we have heard a wonderful recitation. It guides to the right path and we have believed therein and we shall never join in worship anything with our Lord Allah. And that's in the Quran Surah 72 verses 1 to 2. So I alluded to that a little bit earlier where I said Muhammad's Jin converted to Islam. So yeah, I guess that would make sense. Now there's another Islamic prophet who's related to communicating with jinn as well and that's a prophet Suleiman or Solomon in English. In the Quran, Suleiman is the king of ancient Israel and he was granted the gift to speak with animals and jinn. God gave him authority over jinn so Solomon was able to force them to build the first temple. And certain beliefs regarding Solomon and his power over the jinn and everything later actually made its way into folklore so there's all sorts of legends about this. Jinn are also believed to resemble humans in what they drink and what they eat. They also have children and they can pass away. And they also are subject to the judgment that's going to happen in the end times. So just like it said for humans, they're going to be judged according to their deeds. So if they're judged to be good, they're going to attain paradise. If they're judged to be evil, they get punished with hell. And jinn, you know, they can also appear in the form of animals, which I found was pretty interesting. And that leads me to my next fact. So there are different types of jinn, like some can fly, others can shape shift, although they cannot appear as the Prophet Muhammad. That's one power that they don't have. There's a passage from the Hadith that explains this. It says, there are three types of jinn. One type that fly about through the air all the time. Another type that appears as a snake and dogs. And an earthbound type which resides in one place or wanders about. Another passage from the Hadith says, Whosoever sees me, i.e. the Prophet Muhammad, in a dream, then it is me, for the devils cannot appear like me. Now one of the scariest things about jinn, probably the most scariest thing about the jinn, is that people can actually be possessed by them. Oftentimes people who are possessed by jinns may not be in agony or a lot of pain like we see sometimes in the movies. However, individuals may get like super angry or feel like they're forced to do a certain act without being able to help themselves from committing that act to whatever it is. And yeah, so you would have to go through an exorcism to get rid of the jinn. And the final fact I want to share is jinn apparently thrive in places like the desert and places like the mountains. Pakistan, for example, is a place that is known for jinn. As well as there's reports that jinn were in a sinkhole in the waste outside of Kardor, Somalia. And other jinn haunt ruins and caves, crossroads, garbage dumps, as well as large bodies of water and even the upper atmosphere. Graveyards are also another place that jinn like to hang out. So yeah, just be careful where you travel to because you might just run into a jinn. Starting at number 10, the first thing I want to do is look more into the word jinn. Now jinn is a noun and it's a plural term. In Persian, it literally means hidden from sight and it derives from the Arabic root jan or jinn meaning to hide or to be hidden. So we know that the jinn is mentioned in the Quran and other Islamic text. However, the word or the concept of jinn as described in Islam doesn't show up in the original Hebrew text of the Bible, but the Arabic word for jinn is often used in several old Arabic translations of the biblical text. In the book of Isaiah chapter 6, there's a seraphim that are mentioned and the word means burning or fiery ones. Some translations say fiery serpents. Now the seraphims are creatures that appear to the prophet Isaiah having six wings and as I mentioned in part 1, the jinn according to Islam are made out of fire and so are the seraphim. Now did you know that there are inscriptions found in the northwestern region of the Arabian Peninsula that appear to indicate that jinn were actually worshipped at one point or were at least recognized for having a higher status. And these inscriptions date hundreds of years before Islam as an organized religion. One example of this is an inscription 
from Beth Faziel near Palmyra in Syria and it pays tribute to the Janae which refers to the good and rewarding gods. Now I want to take a look more into the organization of the Jinn community. So these communities are very similar to humans apparently. They have kings and rulers, they have courts that uphold the law, they also conduct wedding ceremonies and a whole lot more. Now one common belief in Islam is that there are at least five distinct classes or types of demons. Among them the Jinn are listed. There's a Marid which is the strongest type, then there's the Ifrit, then there's Shaitan, the Jinn of course, and then and the Jan, which are the weakest types. And you know, some traditions look at the Jin and divide them up into three classes. Those who have wings and they fly around, also those who look like snakes and dogs and other animals, and then there's those who travel around the world continuously. There's also stories of Jin and they can be found in various Muslim cultures around the world. In Sindh, the concept of the Jinni was introduced during the Abbasid era and has become a common part of the local folklore, which also includes stories of both male jinn which are called jinn and female jinn which are called jinniri. Now some other stories including jinn can be found in the 1001 night story of the fishermen and the jinni. More than three different types of jinn are described in the story of Maruf the cobbler. Now most of us know that there's a very powerful jinni that helps a young Aladdin in the story of Aladdin and the wonderful lamp. And if you look around you can find many other stories mentioning jinn. Now another interesting fact is that during their Rwandan genocide, both Hutus and Tutsis, they avoided searching in the local Rwandan Muslim neighborhoods and they really believed myths that the local Muslims and mosques were protected by powerful Islamic magic as well as jinn. Arsonists, they actually ran away instead of burning down mosques because they believed that the jinn were standing guard on the mosque and they feared that the jinn would attack them. There's also a modern city of Dioband in Uttar Pradesh in India. India. And the word Dio from Hindi is a synonym of Jinn and the term band means closed. And that term can also be translated as captured in the Hindi language. And now the legend goes like this. There was this once ferocious Jinn and there was an elderly man that put an end to him by capturing him into a bottle and sealing him away for all eternity. Another version describes that there were two not just one Jinn and the bottles were said to be sealed away in the dungeon of a mosque that's located on a hill in the city itself which has never been opened since then. Now in Surat Al Rahman verse 33 in the Quran, Allah actually reminds the Jinn as well as humans that they would possess the ability to pass beyond the furthest reaches of space only by his power though. And the last thing I want to share is that in another surat, Surat Al Jinn verses 8 to 10, Allah also narrates concerning the Jinn how they actually touched or sought the limits of the sky and found that there were some guards there as well as shooting stars. And this was all a warning to humans. And it goes on to further say that the Jinn used to set up stations in the sky and then they would listen to divine decrees as they passed down through angels. But those who actually attempted to listen now, now, after the revelation of the Quran, they'll actually find fiery guards awaiting them. So the Quran forbids association with God and advises people to not worship jinns at all. And the Quran says, and they imagine kinship between him and the jinn, whereas the jinn know well that they will be brought before him. And that's in the Quran, Surah 37, verses 158. Most people think when somebody is possessed by jinn, he or she must behave in a particular way. But there are many ways that jinn possession can affect a person. Starting with number 10, we have regional possession. This is a type of possession that can be very alarming and scary. It occurs as a seizure in your sleep when you can't really move or speak and it happens so quick that it could be just seconds or minutes and in most cases, if not at all, the jinn does this from the outside. Usually it's a flying type of jinn. Yeah, very scary. Now moving on to number nine, we have projectory possession. This is a type of possession that a jinn takes possession of a person for a specific time period. It could be for hours, during the day or night, then leaves the body and comes back the next day or the next week or the next month or the next year. 
And in some very rare cases, it doesn't come back at all. And the jinn, when it leaves the body, it can feel like a sensation similar to a sudden shaking or shivering in the legs or it can feel like a big burst of air leaving your mouth. The possession type of number eight is accompanying possession. The jinn permanently takes possession of one part of the body, like the leg, even the uterus or the spine of a person, or it can take possession of the entire body, day and night, whether you're sleeping or awake. It's almost like it becomes a part of your physical body completely. Number seven brings us external possession. Now, external possession is a type of jinn possession where the jinn accompanies a person full-time or part-time. Now, the jinn has the ability to take the form of another human being or animal that can physically touch a person. Or the jinn can do things like sit on a person's back or press down on their chest. They also even whisper into a person's ear. Now, as mentioned, they do take on the form of animals, but this also goes to insects. They can take on those forms. They can become flies as well. And this one is particularly scary because in some cases, the jinns can bruise you or rip your clothing through external possession. The jinn can also take the form of a beautiful woman or a man to have intimate relations with their target. Moving on now to number six, this is transistus possession. This is a type of a possession where more than one person is haunted simultaneously by a jinn. And usually it happens to people who have close relationships to each other. This is why it's called transistus, meaning to pass over or crossing through. And it could be one or more jinn that can haunt a group or family or team of some sort in this type of possession. Moving on out to number five, we have imaginary possession. Yeah, this is a type of uh, delusion and it's said to be the most common type of jinn possession, surprisingly. Like for instance, imaginary epilepsy is a thing which is a result of interacting with those who are actually possessed, then starting to imagine that you yourself have those same exact symptoms, or maybe an exorcist or spiritual healer suggests to you that you are afflicted by a jinn. And it all starts with an idea, then it becomes a belief that you're possessed, and then you start acting as if you're possessed. Now, the next type of possession at number four, false pretense, it's actually similar to imaginary possession that I just mentioned, but this time the person is conscious of what they're doing. Some people who do this, they go back and forth to their spiritual healers or exorcists with their own agenda in mind. They have their own goals. They continue to attend healing sessions and they scream and they shout and they say that they're here for whatever reason, they're experiencing this, and really they're actually not possessed or afflicted by a jinn in any way at all. All of this is to seek attention from others or to have an excuse for their bad behavior. So yeah, that one is not really a type of possession, but you get what I mean. Now, number three is the presence of waswasa. Now this means suggestions and whispering, and it is an overwhelming form of possession that is very stressful for a person. The jinn haunts a person, making them cry and laugh and become really, really angry without any explanation. And this happens at random times. This type of possession of the jinn could last for hours or days or for the whole lifespan of a person. And this causes severe anxiety and can even cause obsessive compulsive disorder or OCD. So possession type at number two is brain influence. The jinn uses a person's brain to control the human senses, to control the nervous system, control the muscles. So yeah, this one is strictly to do with uh, the brain and how the brain operates but the possession type at number one also pretty similar to brain influence well we have mind influence and uh, this is a type of possession that the jinn doesn't actually possess the physical body or the nervous system or the brain or anything like that this is strictly mental so images can flash in a person's mind or scenes of chilling events can be seen as if they are watching a movie, but nothing physical actually happens. It's just up in the mind. So yeah, it makes you wonder when all those people in your life have said that, hey, they've heard voices, maybe they've seen something and you may have labeled it as them going crazy, but yeah, they could have been possessed by a djinn. <laughs>